This is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and I'm joined with my good friend Ty Braneman from Love to HVAC. And today we're going to be going over the different types of HVAC metering devices found on air conditioning systems. So on an air conditioning system, here's the indoor coil, and they're mounted right at the inlet of the indoor coil. And we're going to be going over fixed orifices such as capillary tubing. We're also going to be going over pistons. And so there's a little tiny orifice inside here. We're also going to be going over the thermostatic expansion valve, and this can actually regulate the amount of refrigerant going in, can adjust it, and it works by pressures. And then also we're going to be going over the electric expansion valve. So this is electrically driven with 12 volt pulses in order to increase or decrease the pathway size inside the body of the EEV. The capillary tube is a great metering device back in the day. You still see these used today in refrigerators and freezers, but the idea was not only the size of this tubing, but also the length of this tubing. It caused the right amount of restriction so that we controlled the flow into the evaporator. And they work really good when you don't have a lot of varying loads, such as a freezer that's inside the house. The outdoor temperature is the same and the indoor temperature is the same. So for that application, they work well. For a refrigeration air conditioning system, even though they were used because they were cost effective, they didn't control the flow all so well. And also the tubing, the length of the tubing was an issue. They could easily get stopped up, so we had a strainer in here so that we could filter it and clean it to make sure these tubings was clean. So they actually came up with another way of doing it, the same thing. We want to be able to restrict the flow of refrigerant, but be able to make it where we can adjust. So with this capillary tube, it was pretty much set in place. It was very difficult to adjust. So then they came out with fixed orifice. And the great thing about fixed orifice for a manufacturer is they could change out the orifice size. So I could manufacture one evaporator coil for multiple different systems. And then all they have to do is simply change out the fixed orifice. So this coil may be for a three ton or a four ton just by simply changing out the fixed orifice. And there's efficiency and a lot of other math that goes into that, but it was a great way to be able to modify that. But still that fixed orifice is at the mercy of the conditions. As the outdoor temperature goes up, you have more pressure pushing on the liquid. So you literally push more liquid into the evaporator coil as the outdoor temperature goes up. Because there's no control of that, the indoor temperature and humidity affected how fast we boil that refrigerant to a vapor. So your superheat could be as low as 5 or as high as 30, and it would still be correct. Doesn't mean it's working very efficient, especially if your superheat's 30, most of your evaporator coil is a superheated vapor. You have very little refrigerant changing state. On the other hand, if we get below 5, we've overfilled the evaporator coil and we potentially get liquid refrigerant coming back to the compressor. So while the metering device itself is very simple, it doesn't have a way of controlling the refrigerant flow inside that evaporator coil. So on these fixed orifices, like what Ty's holding right here, these are distributor tubes. So on a uh, fixed orifice such as this right here, you just have this. So you have the liquid entering in, high pressure, high temperature, subcooled liquid entering this restriction. It's going to lower the pressure and then it's going to go through these distributor tubes to distribute it to multiple points inside of the evaporator coil. And so then as the refrigerant is now a low pressure, low temperature, primarily liquid refrigerant, but there's a little bit of flash gas because you're lowering the pressure, it's going to be low in temperature. And so it's going to be doing what's called a phase change for most of the interior volume of the coil. And that's where the secret to the whole thing occurs at. If the refrigerant is changing phase, that is where it's going to be able to absorb most of the heat at. It's going to be at a lower temperature. The refrigerant traveling through is going to be at a lower temperature than the air crossing the coil. So the refrigerant is able to absorb all that heat into the refrigerant flow through the evaporator coil and out to the outdoor condenser where it's going to be rejecting the heat at. I think that's a great point. One of the things that people overlook is the importance of that phase change, that refrigerant boiling. As it's boiling, changing state from a liquid to vapor, it's latent heat. It's absorbing a massive amount of BTU of heat. And as we're boiling it, the heat from the air is making that refrigerant boil. But as the refrigerant boil, it's actually absorbing the heat out of the air. So the air comes in warmer, leaves out cooler. The refrigerant simply changed state, but that changes states where most of our cooling is coming from. We're going to be measuring superheat, but that's sensible heat. There's ultimately very little BTUs of heat energy in that superheat. However, the superheat will tell us how much vapor we have. And if I know I have this much vapor, we know the rest is going to be a liquid vapor mixture. And that's where our cooling capacity is at. Right. So after the phase change, the refrigerant is going to be completely in the vapor state and it's going to come through this pipe and go out to the outdoor unit. So 
this is going to be uh, not really adjusting the amount of refrigerant into that indoor coil when you have a changing heat load. So if you have a very hot and humid home and you are really wanting the system to work efficiently, a thermostatic expansion valve is a much better choice. As well, if you're in a dry climate, a thermostatic expansion valve will also meter the amount of refrigerant entering into the coil so that you don't have liquid heading back to the outdoor unit and then inevitably into that compressor. Remember, it's a vapor compressor. You can't have any liquid entering it where it's gonna damage it. All right, so what's happening here with a thermostatic expansion valve, you can see the head is really rusty on this one. Uh, so this one has leaked out the refrigerant charge from the bulb area. But a TXV is gonna work on three pressures and a TXV is mounted right here. So you have this bulb is mounted on the low pressure suction line exiting the coil. And then you have the external equalization line right here is mounted actually taking a pressure on the vapor line. So these two are, are usually right next to each other. And then we also have a spring pressure. So the bulb, as this refrigerant, if it's, if it's really hot, a vapor, what's gonna happen is this bulb is gonna apply more pressure down on the head of the TXV and it's gonna open the internal pathway compared to the pressure from the external equalization line, this one right here, and the spring pressure. And so it's able to hold a certain amount of superheat. So superheat is the temperature increase of the vapor refrigerant. So if you have a phase change occurring from liquid to vapor, then you're gonna have the, it change completely into a vapor state. And then from there, the vapor is going to increase in temperature. That's called superheat. And so the TXV might try to hold a superheat of about eight degrees. So a temperature increase of say eight degrees. So if this is 40 degree coil and it's looking for eight degrees, it's gonna have a 48 degree temperature vapor exiting the coil. So if we think about that fixed orifice, it can't control how much is in here. The conditions inside and outside is changing, but this TXV is awesome because like Craig said, it's gonna control, it's gonna measure the superheat with the sensing bulb and the suction line temperature to open and close. So as the conditions change, it actually opens and lets more refrigerant in to keep the right amount of refrigerant in that evaporator coil. As the conditions change the opposite direction, it'll close off so that it's keeping the right amount of refrigerant in that evaporator coil. And it does this by measuring that superheat. So if I know there's this much vapor, we know the rest of that's working quite efficiently, but not just efficiently, but it's working better. It's able to actually control that refrigerant flow and and it helps protect that compressor, assuming your airflow is correct. Some TXVs, they, the older style, they get a bad name because of the heads that were not now stainless steel like they are now. So these stainless steel heads and the stainless steel capillary tube that heads to the bulb. Uh, so this is not gonna rust out. It's not gonna be uh, as susceptible to leaking the refrigerant charge out. So there will be refrigerant in this bulb that is separate from the refrigerant in the system. It's, it's just from the head to the bulb. And so the bulb, basically it's making surface contact with this vapor line and it's going to absorb that heat into the bulb, then into the refrigerant. And what we know about the saturated refrigerant where there's liquid and vapor in this bulb, it's going to be able to apply pressure down if the temperature increases. That's how the refrigerant works. It's gonna apply pressure downwards. It's gonna open the little pin assembly. It's gonna allow more refrigerant in. And so, you know, if you lose the refrigerant charge on the head, it's not gonna be able to open up the internal pathway to push against the spring pressure and the ex external equalization pressure. And in the system, we have its own refrigerant charge here. So it's gonna be separate from the refrigerant that's in the system. So right here, if we were to cut this line right now, you would hear a little bit of refrigerant come out because it's its own enclosed system right here. So as the temperature of this bulb goes up, the pressure goes up and it actually pushes on a little diaphragm. As the temperature of this sensing bulb goes down, the pressure goes down and the diaphragm is able to be pushed back by a spring inside the bulb. It's a very simple little process using simply temperature and pressure and it has its own charge. So you also want to make sure these lines aren't rubbing against anything because if it rubs the hole, you lose the charge in this bulb. So if we lose the charge in the bulb, it cannot control superheat, but it doesn't mean that if we have a leak here that we're having a leak in the system. They are in their own separate little cycle. Right, great, great points, Ty. And so, uh, let's see here. So these TXVs like this right here, they're made to be able to change out or basically sit in between a piston chamber. Uh, we have another TXV that will fit in this little chamber right here. So if we got a 
coil say that was new or we pumped the refrigerant system down and now this is empty we could technically open up this chamber here remove the piston and replace it with a thermostatic expansion valve so this right here we've removed the piston out and we can screw this in right here and then mount this right here and now we have a thermostatic expansion valve and that is going to be able to uh, have the system work a lot more efficiently because it's going to be able to absorb more heat from inside the building structure during air conditioning mode. And so that's fantastic. So we don't want to be removing TXVs and putting pistons back in. We want to be installing the thermostatic expansion valves. Uh, and once again, they get blamed a lot as being the problem, but a lot of times they are, most of the time, they are not the problem. Uh, so there could have been some type of gumming in the past due to an oil additive and maybe not brazing while flowing nitrogen and that could have clogged up the inside so that could be an issue. The older style heads could have uh, rusted and leaked the charge, that's a possibility. But a lot of times it's other things as well like a strainer screen that could be right at the inlet of the thermostatic expansion valve. So if you are not brazing while flowing nitrogen, like basically you're not flowing any nitrogen through it, you're going to have oxidation flakes on the inside of the tubing and that's going to, uh, the oil actually is going to be washing that and pushing that onto the strainer screen and it'll clog it up and that's the problem, not this. So that could stop the flow up. And in the older days we had a mineral oil and mineral oil didn't clean that oxidation off the lines. But now we have a polyester oil, also called a PoE oil, and that PoE oil actually cleans that oxidation off so it's more of an issue today than it was in years past. And another issue that you could have is that the filter dryer at the inlet, so say like a filter dryer is right here, and you have high pressure liquid coming in, if it doesn't make it over to the piston as a fully liquid refrigerant, and you have a pressure drop across the filter because it's clogged, that could be a problem as well. And so you don't want to blame the piston, you don't want to blame the TXV in that instance, you can actually take a temperature measurement across the filter dryer in order to see if there is a temperature drop. If there's a temperature drop, there's a pressure drop on the inside and that means it, it could be clogged. A lot of times when it's clogged, it's because of not flowing nitrogen. So you're just brazing the, the refrigerant lines by itself and uh, you just have all the oxidation. It's just completely clogging up the pre-filter on the filter dryer. Remember the filter dryer's job is to absorb any uh, water vapor in the system to stop it from mixing with the oil, which would create acid in the system. And in the past, we've both talked about making sure we don't have contamination. We're putting the gauges on or yeah. taking the gauges off. If you're taking the gauges off and you allow that contamination, even if the system was clean originally, we can actually accidentally introduce contaminants and moisture, and that can cause you to clog up as well. But Craig, there's a big argument over where this filter dryer should be. I hear it all the time, people arguing over it. Where do you prefer the filter dryer? So I always prefer it inside the building, right before the evaporator coil, so in a location where you can get to it. I wouldn't have it installed outside. I mean, where we live at, we're near the, the ocean, and so you're going to have these rotting really quickly. And so you can see here's the paint here, here's the rust here. That's going to cause a refrigerant leak because it's very thin metal. And so I always want to have that inside. Yeah, when I've come here where you're closer to the ocean, I see all kinds of rust. I've also lived in Las Vegas where there's almost no moisture at all and you never see them resting. So that location you're going to be at is going to play a big part of that. Yeah. And I think also the attics is going to play a part. If you're in a dry climate and you're up in a very tight attic, I don't want to be doing a whole lot of extra brazing there. So it's not just simply a yes or no answer. Best practice says we want to have it before the metering device so that we can actually filter anything before it gets to that metering device and keep it clean. Especially in a climate like this, you don't want to have it outside because look how rusted this is. That is going to be a leak point and that is going to be a failure and we want to make sure we're taking care of our customers. So here, for sure, we do not want to have this outside. Now you might find some thermostatic expansion valves in air conditioning that have an adjustable stem on the bottom and a lot of times they're just fixed. This has an adjustable stem, this has an adjustable stem, and everything else on this table is non-adjustable. And so you see a little flat bottom like that, there's no adjustment. You should not be adjusting the spring pressure on here. That would be the absolute last thing that you would ever do on an air conditioning system. It's usually going to be some other problem. A lot of times it's a low airflow issue. As much as I like these mechanical thermostatic expansion valves, now we have some new technology. We actually have electronic expansion valves. 
and they're going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be opening and closing to control the amount of refrigerant inside this evaporator coil. These EEVs, electric expansion valves, are going to be able to open and close the internal pathway inside, and this is a, a circuit board off of a mini split, and what's going to happen is this will be monitoring a temperature of the coil and, and then also an air temperature in order to open or close the pathway here on a uh, ducted air conditioning system, we might be measuring the coil temperature and also the suction line temperature in order for the circuit board to make the decision in order to uh, basically just slightly shut this a little bit. Basically the object is that this is going to make minute changes, very, very small changes to the pathway inside to have an effective superheat. If you have an effective superheat, then you're going to have an effective amount of phase changing refrigerant in the coil flowing through in order to absorb the heat. So this is going to have 12 volt pulses heading to it in order to open or close the pathway. And so this one happens to be rusted, so I can't pull that one off, but maybe I'll just pull this one off. So it comes in two pieces like this, stainless steel, or it could just be a, a different type of metal here. Uh, then you have your brass body or your copper body or stainless steel, and then you're going to have your copper tubing. Here you have the EEV head. And so you have multiple teeth on the inside, it might be 40 teeth. And what it's doing is it's taking uh, 12 volt pulses and making it into an electrical magnet and applying magnetic force on the teeth and it's lining up with a permanent magnet on the inside of the EEV. So these electronic expansion valves actually have over 200 steps between all the way open and all the way closed. And it can do it very, very fast. So like Ty's saying, uh, the amount of steps are 12 volt pulses and it makes these little minute changes in the inside of the body of the EEV. And what may occur is the system may fully shut or fully open the EEV upon the next time it's turning on. What it's doing is it's, it's going to try to locate the pin position by, by putting all the amount of 12 volt pulses on to spin this magnet right here because this is an internal permanent magnet. It's got many north and south poles on it and so I've got a whole other video on EEVs in order to be able to, to see fully how they work. And while the refrigerant charge is very important on no matter what system you're working with, an electronic expansion valve and a mechanical thermostatic expansion valve are going to be able to open and close and regulate so it won't be quite as critical. If we're talking about a fixed orifice or a capillary tube system, the refrigerant charge is absolutely critical. Just simply changing the airflow will change the charge of that system. So we know that the thermostatic expansion valve and the EEV are going to do the best jobs at controlling the amount of refrigerant flowing through the coil to maintain efficiency on the system and also compressor safety. Remember that the thermostatic expansion valve acts basically on its own to regulate the refrigerant, whereas a EEV needs multiple 12 volt pulses on the either five wire setup or six wire setup in order to adjust the refrigerant. And while the capillary and fixed orifice is absolutely simplest, it's at the mercy of all the changing conditions. On some systems you might find fixed orifices uh, such as the, the capillary tubing because it's a lower cost. So on a small window air conditioner you might see something like that, capillary tubing. And so it's just not worth the expense of adding in a, a more sophisticated metering device in that instance. But in the instance of air conditioning in a home or a building, it's totally worth having that thermostatic expansion valve or EEV in the system. Well, I think we covered a lot of information on metering devices today. And if you want to learn more about Ty, most of you, I'm sure, already know him. But he's at Love to HVAC and various social media platforms, including YouTube. And you can also look up his name, Ty Braneman. So he's an awesome, awesome guy, excellent teacher, and a good friend. Thank you. Be sure to check out AC Service Tech. Their website has a massive information, not just videos, but help cards, multiple different books. And that new mini split book you had is absolutely incredible. I learned so many things going through that. And there's a lot of the details about these EEVs that's in there, especially for those ductless systems. It's like no other book that's out there, but tons of resources. I use your resources in my classes all the time, and I sure appreciate you having me out today. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.